Bruchem Aboyim. Thank you very much for coming. Again, uh, this is the new normal, and welcome to our house. The um, lecture tonight, uh, very important, I think very apropos, it's on Rosh Hashanah 2020. We are now in the month of Elul. Next week will be Rosh Hashanah, followed by Yom Kippur. By the way, next week there will be no class. So I have a wedding we have to attend, and uh, so this will be the lecture before Rosh Hashanah. In my lifetime, there has never been a time when there was even a thought, let alone a, a question, whether I would attend services for the high holidays or not. Synagogues closed for the holidays? That would seem like a bad joke. How can houses of worship close on the holiest days, the holiest time of the year? That's what they're all about, the Shabbat and the Yom Tovim, the holidays. It seems paradoxical that at a time in our lives when we need to connect to God, to our friends, to our families, at this time of great need, many of our synagogues will be closed for the high holidays. And even those that will be open will hopefully be practicing social distancing and masks. 2020 a term used for hindsight. They say that hindsight is 2020, and that we look back on our lives and then it becomes very clear as to what we should have done, coulda, woulda, shoulda, and the reality of our decisions become crystal clear. When Abraham, our father, was on the road taking his only son Yitzchak to the place that God would show him, the incident that we call the Akedat Yitzchak, the binding of Yitzchok. The verse states, Vayaras HaMokam Erechok. And Avrabino, and he saw the place from a distance. We see that the word Makom, place is used many times in the Torah, actually to allude to God Almighty himself. This designation is based on the fact that God is not in the world, but the world is within God. This name of God is also found in the Passover, in the Pesach Haggadah. <clears throat> there, is a, there it states, Baruch HaMokom, Baruch Hu, which translates to mean, blessed is God, blessed is He. So when Abraham, when Abraham was on his way to bring up his only son as a sacrifice to God, somehow he felt that God was not with him. He felt abandoned. But then he looked back, the Yairus HaMokom Erechok, he looked back at the past, at his life, at all that had transpired in days gone. And there he saw God's presence very clearly. It was up close and very real. And with that hindsight, he knew just as God was with him in the past, so too would he also be with him now at the greatest moment of need. <clears throat> this realization and recognition requires two things. First, you have to open your eyes, your spiritual eye, that which exists deep within each and every one of us, what we call the Pintaliid, that spark of divinity which each of us possess. You know, there's a reason why the eye is the only part of the body that recoils whenever anything physical tries to touch it. Though it is physical, in some way it is connected to the spiritual as well, so to speak, the windows of the soul. And secondly, you have to be looking. How many opportunities pass us by in life just because we weren't paying attention? We weren't looking. I always tell my managers a football analogy <clears throat> to make them understand the importance of looking. Not just opening your eyes, but looking with the intent of actually seeing something. I tell them, that a great quarterback is not someone who has a great arm or great mobility. No. What makes a great quarterback is the ability, someone who has the ability to see the field. In his mind's eye, he is able to take in the whole field. He sees all the defense. Then he can adjust his play to capitalize on their weaknesses. <laughs> you know, when I started in the deli many years ago, restaurant business. We used to make a dish with schmaltz herring. Schmaltz herring doesn't necessarily taste too good, smell too good. And so there was a 
person above me that would that showed me how to clean the fish. And um, but we we do it only once every few weeks, once a month. And he would look at me. He said, "Do you know how to do the schmaltz herring?" And I would say, "No." And he would look at me. Didn't I show it to you? And I would say, "No." And he would show me again. But in reality, I never really learned how to skin and bone the herring. You see, I looked at what he did, but I really didn't see anything. I didn't want to learn. <clears throat> we see this scenario played out in the Torah with the story of Hagar and Yishmoel. They were driven out of Avrabino's house and they wandered in the desert, but Yishmoel was sick and on the verge of death. So Hagar, his mother, had no water to give him and so she laid him down by a bush and she walked a distance away to not watch him die. But an angel came of God appeared to Hagar and assured her that she and her son would survive and that he would sire a great nation. The angel then goes on to tell Hagar that there was a well a short distance away from her. The well wasn't miraculous. The well had been there all the time. She just didn't look. She didn't see. So too in our lives. God always brings the cure before the sickness. But like Hagar, we too need to look. Most of the riches in the world, gold, silver, diamonds, are buried deep in the earth, and one has to dig deep to find them. One may even get a little dirty in the process. And so too in our lives. We need to know that at the end of time, when we look back at all of our trials and tribulations, all of our failed efforts, all of our pain, misery, and disappointments, all those times in our lives that may well have seemed the worse while we lived through them. We need to know with complete certainty that everything, everything that happens in our lives is part of a master plan that was custom made for each one of us for our own benefit. Our itinerary was written before we were born. All we need to know is that every experience in our lives is all part of a journey that ends at a place that we call paradise. All's well that ends well. We just need to believe and most of all, stay the course. You know, the, holo high, the high holidays are a time of introspection, a time to take what we call cheshbon nefesh, an accounting of our souls. God is sending us a message that we can all agree on. What that message is, well, that may be a point of contention depending on many different factors. If somehow we do not come out of this moment in time better, smarter, more appreciative, humbler, more aware of our mortality, then we've really missed the point. Who would have believed that a small virus would be able to affect 7.7 .7 billion people, the whole world, at the same time? It really sounds like something out of a science fiction movie. The problem is that we are the actors, <clears throat> and the story is all too real. We are living it. God doesn't want to punish us as a loving father. He just wants us to be good. If not, he at least wants us to try to be better. Accepting who we are is not an option. We have to grow. We can't wait for life and its opportunities <clears throat> to come to us. We need to be aggressive. We need to be the players and not the spectators. We always need to be moving toward the ball and not waiting for the ball to come to us. It's hard to appreciate tough love, especially in the moment. But in hindsight, 2020, it is the greatest gift that a loving parent can give a child. It shows the child that they care. So what is it that God is trying to tell us? You know, there's a verse in the fifth book of the Torah, in the book of Devarim, in the portion of Kisavo, 2847. It states, Tachat asher et Since when you had everything, 
You did not obey the Lord your God in joy and with a happy heart. The verse goes on to say that because of your ingratitude, all the 98 retributions will befall you. It's a cute story. I had a friend who at the time had one child. He was about three years old. And it was the middle of the night and uh, his wife heard some noises. She woke him up. And sure enough, he got out of bed. I don't know if I would have. But he got out of bed and he walked through the house trying to figure out where the noise was coming from. And as he walked down a long hallway, he passed a room that his three-year-old son used as a playroom. He passed the room, the door, and then he stepped back. And he looked. And what he saw was his three-year-old son sitting, bouncing up and down on a rocking horse, singing at the top of his lungs, with a half gallon of ice cream underneath his arm, and he was spooning the ice cream into his mouth, singing and bouncing up and down. And my friend says to me, I know I should have punished him, but I was so busy laughing that I just told him to go to sleep. You know, I think that's exactly what God does with us. As long as we're happy, as long as we're enjoying, as long as we're grateful, he just smiles when he sees us sinning and says, go to sleep, do a better job tomorrow. The concept is very easy to understand. Imagine if you were totally dependent on one individual and that person took care of all your needs day after day. How often would you thank that individual? Once a year? Once a month? Once a day? Or would your benefactor's name be on your lips constantly? After all, there's nothing that he needs from you. However, there is one thing that he does request. Be polite. Just say thank you. But these words must come with it from a true sense of appreciation. You know, in prayer in Hebrew, the Hebrew word is tefillah taled, the prayers of the heart. If our minds and our hearts don't connect, if all we do is just say the words, then we really know better than a parrot. No benefactor, no parent, no individual wants to be taken for granted. Sometimes an insincere expression of gratitude can even be worse than no thank you at all. Many of us see prayer three times a day as a, sh as a chore. When things are going well in our lives, even if we say the words, they are really said many times out of rote. We give very little, very little thought to what we are saying and to whom we are saying it to. We have fulfilled our obligation. Hmm. Obligation. The Kabbalists tell us that there are angels that pray to God Almighty only once in their whole existence. The highest of angels are permitted to stand before God in prayer only once a day. We, the children of Israel, are honored and privileged to be able to stand before him in prayer three times daily. But do we see it as a privilege <laughs> or an obligation? Do we ever feel good about the fact that our prayers that in our prayers we actually said thank you to God for all the many blessings that he bestows upon us. Do we even stop and think that we are actually talking to God? Is God listening? And if he is, wow, can you imagine that? But if that's the case, then how is it possible for us to recite words spoken from our lips with little or no connection to our hearts? Think about it. These questions only exist when things are going well. When things are bad, <laughs> prayer takes on a totally different tone and demeanor. At these times, we become humble. We see ourselves as lacking. We see ourselves estranged from God, and we seek out those individuals who we feel have a special relationship with Him, we turn to our rabbis, our friends, those who we feel know exactly who and where God is. At least that is our hope and prayer. As the saying goes, there's no atheist in a foxhole. Then our words during troubled times are heartfelt, deep, and sincere. Because now we need something. The greater the need, the greater the sincerity, the deeper the prayer. I had a thought just the other day. The hardest place to find God 
is amazingly in affluence. And that's the one place where he was actually the most visible. Look at the world today. The further we drift away from God and Torah values, the more violence and chaos exist in the world. We should all be dancing in the streets, not rioting. We are living in the most affluent of times. And yet, there is so much turbulence and negativity. But why? If you look into the Torah, we may see history repeating itself. You know, the generation before the flood lived in moral and social depravity. But on a material level, there was great wealth. Medrash tells us that the land was so fertile <clears throat> that one would plant and harvest his fields only once in 40 years. What brought about the total destruction of mankind? It was civil unrest, lawlessness, and robbery. This was all before the giving of the Torah. Mankind was living by man's laws, but in reality they had sunk to the level of animals. It was, society, it was a society based on the concept of might makes right. In fact, the measure states that people had sunk so low that they were even getting married to their animals. With this pandemic, God is making a statement. He is telling us, I am still in charge. <clears throat> he is telling us that everything, everything is his. It is only by his grace that we live and breathe. Yes, breathe. Something else that we have taken for granted. Before this pandemic, if someone were to ask you, what was the most important thing in your life? I can guarantee you no one would have said air. Now today, we see it as a true blessing, a gift from God, one that we must thank, say thank you for. Mankind began with, with the act of God blowing into Adam, first man's nostrils, the breath of life. I believe as we look around us today, we see all the prophecies of the coming of the Messiah coming true before our eyes. World recession, social unrest, children rebelling against their parents. The list goes on. But no matter what happens, no matter what happens, you can smell the winds of change in the air. Everything. Everything is moving at warp speed. The world is running toward its destiny. May God help us. But we, have always, we always have to remember, we are the masters of our destiny. Who we are, what we are, makes a difference, not just on a personal level, but even on a world level. Look around you. There's a strong belief that one woman coming out of a lab in Wuhan, China has infected over 27 million people and killed almost a million worldwide. All 7.7 .7 billion people on this planet have been affected in some way by this virus. Now, nine months ago, you wouldn't have believed it possible. So we are, as the Lubavitcher Rebbe of Blessed Memory stated, we are the last generation before the coming of Messiah. We refer to his coming as the birth of the coming of the Messiah and Mashiach, which is very apropos. When a woman is going through childbirth, her birthing coach is telling her over and over again, breathe, breathe. And then at the first critical second of birth, when the baby emerges from the womb, the baby has to take its first breath. I think that this pandemic is connecting us with a critical time in world history where we will all have to gasp for a new air, for a new reality. What that new world will look like will be predicated on what we create. We have the power to create paradise or we can create hell. The sad truth is that creating hell it's pretty easy. Just talk about it and think about it, but just don't do it. And if you're feeling a little guilty or embarrassed by other people, don't worry, just start and then give up. After all, that is what most of us do most of the time. When we really don't want to do something, it's how we handle it. We find all kinds of reasons and excuses as to why it wasn't our fault. But in the end, 
All excuses are just that, excuses. We are the masters of our own fate. So here we are in the week before the high holidays, the high holiday of Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, one of the holiest days of the year. However, not only do we believe that it is a holy day, but that it is also a day of judgment for every living person in the world, Jew and non-Jew alike. Interestingly enough, in both places where the Torah mentions the holiday, in the third and fourth books of the Torah, it just refers to it as the first day of the month, it shall be a day of blowing for you. There's no mention in the Torah of judgment, repentance, or forgiveness. We blow the shofar as a sign of celebration, and also as a recognition of the, of the coronation of our king, our father. God Almighty. So this leaves us with a question. If Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, is a day of judgment, why doesn't the Torah mention it? Why not call it Yom HaMishpat, which would translate to mean the day of judgment, instead of Yom Rosh Hashanah, the head of the year? We have a tradition that during this time of the year, especially from the beginning of the month of El until the end of Yom Kippur, that these 40 days are special days of repentance. And there's a saying in Hasidus that during this period, we call it the king is in the field, meaning that he is not sitting on his throne, secluded behind palace walls, no. He is out and about amongst the people, approachable. There's no protocol. Much like a politician, a political candidate on the road who is running for office. You know, my dad would always brag that he shook President Reagan's hand at a political rally. I can guarantee you that Reagan wanted to shake my, hand, my father's hand even more than my dad wanted to shake his. Reagan wanted his vote. So we have two events, the coronation of the king and the day of judgment, two themes that seem to have nothing to do with each other. A day of coronation would be a day of joy and celebration. A day of judgment will be a solemn day of prayer and trepidation. So which is it? What are we supposed to do? Laugh or cry? Dance or shiver? Be pessimistic or optimistic? This question bothered me for years. And it's possible that someone might have given me the answer. But somehow the question still remained. So here is how I have come to understand the seeming contradiction of facts and how we should focus on the day with consistency and purpose. Imagine if you were a prince or a princess and you had sinned, upset your father the king at various times and in various ways throughout the year. You know that he is benevolent and that he loves you dearly but and that he has no desire to see you suffer or experience any pain or difficulties. On the other hand, you know that he is the king and that there are laws, boundaries, that must be set and respected. You also know that you have been far, far from perfect in your behavior this year. You want to get back into his good graces again, even though you disobeyed his commands. You know that every year on the anniversary of the day of your father's, the king's coronation, he being in a festive mood, has made it a tradition to pardon and even totally forgive many transgressions that were done by his subjects throughout the year. So we spend the first 30 days of month of El, hopefully involved in some type of introspection. We hope that our Father, the King, will take notice of our efforts and forgive us once again. He is the ultimate optimist. He actually believes that we will be better in the next year. Now this fact is alluded to by the gematria of the Hebrew word hasatan, which means the Satan, again, who is the devil, who is also the prosecuting angel in heaven against us. The numerical value of the word hasatan is 364. Satan has permission to accuse us 364 days of the year. But on Rosh Hashanah, God gives them the day off and tells him not to accuse his, his children. So even though it is a time of the year where there can be and should be some trepidation, 
On the other hand, we have an inside connection, the king. The judge is our father. He wants us to succeed even more than we want to. The love of a parent for their child. You know, the Holy Baal Shem Tov told us that the love that God has for each one of us is even greater than the love that a woman who has been childless for many years and then gives birth to a beautiful son. One can only imagine the love and affection that she feels towards her only child. Well, the love that God Almighty has for each one of us, each one of us is even greater. One of the main suggestions given by the experts to at least slow down this pandemic is social distancing. Social distancing will be defined as giving each individual six feet in each direction. In Judaism, this is referred to as Dalet Amis, an area of four cubits, or roughly, or roughly six feet square. This area in Jewish law is called your private domain, a Rishut Hayochit. One of the miracles of the Holy Temple was that when they stood in the courtyard, they were shoulder to shoulder, like sardines. However, miraculously, when it came time for them to bow, to prostrate themselves, each person had their own Dalet Amas, six foot square. This was one of the ten miracles that was seen in the Holy Temple. So, whether one goes to a synagogue or prays at home this year, if you think about it, in either case, you are in your own domain, much like those who stood in the temple during the service on the high holidays. Yes, there are 7.7 .7 billion people in the world, but for the moment, it's all about you and your Father in heaven. It is just you and him in that six-foot square area. Don't waste the opportunity. Look outside your area. See the pain of your family, your friends, your neighbor next door. See the old woman limping down the street. Pray for them. Remind God that these are all his children. True, they may not deserve, again, but they are his children. True, they may have sinned. True, they may not be what they should be, but they call out to you as a father, not a king. Who can, who can stand before a king? But can any father close his eyes, plug up his ears, shut his heart to the cries of his child? Please, dear Father in heaven, stop the pain, stop the controversies, stop the anger, stop the divisions. It's time, much like the Jewish nation in Egypt, we have hit rock bottom. Save us before we enter the abyss. Save us with the coming of Mashiach, Sikenu, quickly and in our time. Again, thank you very much. Let me wish you and your families a sweet and healthy and prosperous year. It should be a year of goodness. A year of revealed miracles for the whole world. But most of all, let's pray the Mashiach comes because when he does come, what he brings is peace. The one thing that we seem not to be able to find in the world today. Again, God bless you all and thank you for listening.